everybody, it's Miss Audrey from the Fairfield County District Library here at our downtown location in Lancaster and I have a ton of books to talk to you about today. I decided to do biographies and my boss and I, we were brainstorming and the list just kept getting longer and longer and longer and longer. So I'm going to try to do a lightning round for some really cool biographies and autobiographies that have come out in the last couple of years and I'm going to start with some autobiographies. So autobiographies are books that are written in whole or in part by the person about that they're about. Um, we don't have as many of those in the children's or the teen section. Um, usually we just have biographies because it's very hard to ask George Washington to write an autobiography several hundred years after his death. So these are what we have. This came out a couple of years ago. It's by Diane Guerrero and it's called My Family Divided. She wrote it with Erica Morose. Now she is an actress on Orange is the New Black. She was born in the United States, but her parents are from Colombia. And when she was in high school, they were deported while she was at school. So she came home one day and her entire family was gone. So this talks about what it was like for her to finish high school, um, basically couch surfing with friends, what it was like for her to go through college without her parents, what it was like for her to visit them in the detention center, uh, trying to maintain that relationship with them while they were back down in Columbia, uh, how she got into acting professionally, and basically her story from there. It's pretty heart-wrenching at times. She's very upfront about her mental health struggles throughout. And um, this just, it's very well told. It's a very colloquial style. She feels very much like she's talking to the teens, mano a mano the whole time. So I'd recommend this book for, I'd say about fifth grade plus, um, uh, particularly if you've got anybody who's a fan of Orange is the New Black. So this could be an excellent high-low book. Also, if you've got any teenage readers in your life who really like that show, this might be a good pick for them. So My Family Divided by Diane Guerrero is a good choice. The next one I have in this stack is Normal, One Kid's Extraordinary Journal, the Young Reader's Edition. It's written by Magdalena and Nathaniel Newman. Nathaniel was born with uh, Treacher Collins syndrome, which is the craniofacial difference that the main character, Augie from Wonder, has. And um, Nathaniel has been called a Wonder Kid. That's a, a term that has gained popularity since the book Wonder came out. So if there's any uh, youngsters in your life who are just obsessed with the book Wonder, this might be a good choice for them. And it's basically about the family dealing with Nathaniel's health issues from the time he was born. He went through 60 some odd surgeries uh, throughout his life up until he hit his teens, many of which happened before he even went to preschool, just so he could breathe, just so he could eat. Um, it's told largely from his mother's point of view, though there are also sections where he talks to, they take turns talking back and forth, though Magda's uh, definitely, I'd say she talks probably twice as much as he does. There is also some art, not a ton, but there is some in there. So if you've got anybody in your life who's interested in wonder or kids who are interested about craniofacial differences or um, people growing up with health differences, this would be a really good option for them. So Normal by the Newmans. This one was a particularly cool book, though again, some sensitive readers might need a little bit of help with it. It's called We Are Displaced by Malala Yousafzai, and it's uh, my journey and stories from refugee girls from around the world. In this, Malala tells her family's story about how, about how Pakistan changed under the Taliban and about how her how she got shot in the head and how her family had to leave Pakistan, how they chose to leave and are hoping to go back someday and all of that. And interspersed between her stories, she tell uh, she gives 
other refugee girls from refugee camps or former denizens of refugee camps a chance to tell their stories. There are former refugees from Central America, the Middle East, Myanmar, Africa, all over the place. So it's really interesting. It's, I'd say about half of it is Malala's story and about another half of it are, the, are shorter, um, more snapshot versions of other girls' stories from other places. Um, so again, more sensitive readers might be affected very strongly by this, though it is pretty factual. It doesn't go into a lot of really gruesome details, but the mere, you, you get a real sense for the scope of how real the refugee crisis is around the world. And it's very affecting and it's very, very, very well written. It's actually a very easy read as well in terms of how like textual complexity and all of that. Um, so this is a really good option. This one came out last year. This one in a lot of ways I thought was the most interesting of all of these. It's called Proud, Living My American Dream. It's the Young Readers Edition and it's by Olympic Olympic medalist Ibtihaj Muhammad and she's the first hijabi American Muslim um, Olympic competitor um, for the US and she competed in fencing and it's you know hijabi it means that she wears the hijab so she follows a more strict version of Muslim modesty rules and that's a lot of a huge part of what this book is about is what it was like growing up Muslim in New Jersey and following those rules of modesty while playing sports. She talks a lot about how her parents came to Islam and how her faith impacts her life personally. There's also obviously a whole ton about fencing. Uh, it's a very cool book. Um, it, you learn a lot about what she does to train and um, and her life post Olympics. She started up her own fashion line, for example, for women who want to do red carpet events, for example, but who don't necessarily want to show off their bodies, but still look really classy and really elegant and really cool, which I thought was pretty fascinating. So this was a really well written book. And I learned a lot from this book. I really, really liked it. And it came out again uh, in 2018. This was a really good one. I liked it a lot. So those are four really good autobiographies that were written in whole or in part by the people that the books are about. I'm gonna move on to four biographies that have come out in the past year. And I'm gonna start with the one that I thought personally was the most fascinating. This one um, came out in this last year. It's called One Real Amer American, The Life of Ely S. Parker. Seneca Sachem and Civil War General by Joseph Bruchak. Uh, Bruchak is a very well-known uh, Abenaki American um, author. He usually writes young adult books, so he is Native American himself, and though not um, Seneca, he's from farther west. But anyway, um, I had never heard of this gentleman before, and it's utterly fascinating. He was a Civil War general. He was also an engineer. He was a lawyer. He was a political advocate. He learned, started learning English from a very young age and his people used him as a political go-between and simultaneous translator, but basically to try to protect their remaining land in uh, upstate New York from trading companies that were trying to steal their land that was that in their territories that were traditionally theirs. So he started advocating for his people from a really young age and he had a very cool life. Um, he did a lot and he was a close political aide to General Ulysses S. Grant during the Civil War. And it's a fascinating look into Northeastern Native American life in the pre and post Civil War era. Um, one of the more interesting things that I learned from this book that it makes perfect sense in retrospect, but I didn't realize it till I read this is that 
while he trained to be a lawyer, he could not actually take the bar exam because he didn't qualify as a citizen because Native Americans didn't count as citizens until 1924. So how is that for mind-blowing unfairness? Um, this was a really good book. I actually just started to read, stop, uh, finished it yesterday. So this was a good one. Um, excellent choice there. This is probably, this choice here is the youngest book of all of them, I'd say, for about third to fifth grade. And it's Greta's story, the schoolgirl who went on strike to save the planet. And it is about Greta Thunberg. And it was translated by Maureno Giovanni, and it was written by Valentina Camerini. And the illustrations are by Veronica Caratello. And it's a good overview of Greta Thunberg's life and her cause and how she constructed her climate movement. It's got really good illustrations, lots of white space on the pages. Of course, they say illustrations, and then suddenly I can't find them, even though they are all over the place. There we go. Um, there's even a glossary in the back of the more scientific terms. There's good back matter overall for if you want to, um, if you want a timeline about um, important dates in the history of human pollution and global warming. So there's good further information in the back. It's also very upfront about uh, Thunberg's autism and how she sees it as a thing that helps her in her cause, uh, which is a really excellent point of view that you don't often see in the world. Most people see autism as something that hinders them as opposed to something that helps. So I really appreciated seeing that. My next two options are for older readers. I'd say for seventh grade plus, um, and we don't actually own them here at this library, but you can get them through our consortium or uh, e-copies. The first one is called Strongman, The Rise of Five Dictators and the Fall of Democracy. It's by Kenneth C. Davis, who is a New York Times bestselling author. And it, it talks about Mussolini, Hitler, Stalin, Mao, and Saddam Hussein. It talks about how they rose to power, how they kept power using law, media, propaganda, and fear as weapons to bamboozle people and then basically like control them. It's very readable. There are timelines at the beginning of every section. There's posters and photographs. Um, it's very, very readable. I would, the reason why I would say that it's seventh grade plus as opposed to maybe like a strong fifth grade reader is because in, it, because of the subject matter. Again, sensitive readers might have trouble with some of the things depicted, particularly in the chapters with Saddam Hussein. Um, they do, they don't go into details about torture and things, but it is mentioned. Um, Perhaps I am simply inured to the mentions of the Holocaust because I've read so many things about it. Um, but I guess some pretty heavy stuff. So if you've got a fifth grader who's a really strong reader and has a really strong stomach who wants to try it, then by all means, it wouldn't hurt. But I'd say that for the average kid, sixth, seventh grade plus for this one here. The Rise and Fall of Charles Lindbergh by Candace Fleming is my last one from this stack. Candace Fleming is an absolutely phenomenal author. She's written uh, The Family Romanov, which came out a few years ago, which is about the Romanov family, um, the last czarist family in who ruled Russia before the revolution there. She's just written so many fabulous books, and this is no exception. Charles Lindbergh, for those of you who don't know, was the first person to successfully fly across the Atlantic. He was a media sensation, but he was also, and this is what I didn't know until I encountered reviews for this book, he was also a Nazi sympathizer, an anti-Semite, a white nationalist, he was also an environmentalist. It says all of those things on the back. Um, so yeah, he was a very complex person and a very problematic one. And this book does a really great job of tracing his life from start to finish. Um, 
he was not particularly well educated outside of his realm of mechanics and airplanes and how they work and, but he was a very influential person because especially in America he was seen as such a, this great American patriot and hero people listened to him even when he didn't have the foggiest clue what he was talking about like a lot of people of his time he was a strong proponent of eugenics and of the superiority of the white race and he was um, actually a proponent of Hitler for a while he went to the um, Olympic Games that uh, Hitler's Germany hosted and they fed him a whole bunch of propaganda and showed him what they wanted to see when he came back to the US he told everybody about how disciplined the Germans were, how clean they were, how well they ran their country, and also, by the way, their military and their air force is far superior to anything we could possibly do. We should avoid going to war with them at all costs. And while the people who were running our country were not necessarily listening to Charles Lindbergh looking for um, his permission to go to war or anything, lots of common citizens were listening to him and he had whole political rallies that people went to devoted to trying to keep us out of World War II and I had no idea that he had such an active political life so it talks about a lot of stuff in there and one of the things that I found the most fascinating about this book was I think it points out exactly how dangerous smart but not very educated people can be um, when they are um, primed by prejudice and um, stronger personalities and how they can be easily influenced by um, propaganda and media and things of that nature. He, he fell for the Nazis hook, line, and sinker, for example, and he fell for eugenics in the same way when a very strong, influential, scientific guy um, befriended him. So it's it's really, really, really interesting. I, I read it kind of as a cautionary tale. So that was fascinating right there. Um, it was scary. That book was scary. But it was good. But it is thicker and it is longer. So th that's why I'm saying seventh grade plus for that one, though there are some really cool photographs in the middle. All right. Last but not least, I have a little small stack here of, they're kind of quasi-fictionalized um, biographies. They're not quite as strictly factually accurate as these ones. This first one is called Astronauts, Women on the Final Frontier. It is a graphic novel by Jim Ottoviani and Maris Wicks. Um, this is not their first collaboration. They also wrote one called Primates, which was about Jane Goodall and a couple of other ladies who studied, or well, brilliant scientists rather, who studied primates. Um, that's also a fabulous book, by the way. So in this book, it talks briefly, or I'd say about the first third or so, talks about the history of women in aeronautics, um, like ladies who would like to be astronauts. And then it follows more specifically the story of astronaut Mary Cleave and how she became one of the first American women astronauts. And some of my favorite parts include um, the scenes where women are, are advocating for themselves, but the art is absolutely gorgeous and it pays tribute to a whole lot of really cool astronauts as well. And it's funny. This book is very, very funny, and it's very historically accurate, um, just since Mary, Cle since Mary Cleave is being used as the narrator, but Mary Cleave is not actually one of the authors, I am assuming that some of the narration is not actually pulled directly from source documents. They probably had to make some words up. So that's going in my somewhat fictionalized stack there. My next one is also a graphic novel. It's called The Boy Who Became a Dragon, a Bruce Lee story by Jim D. D. Bartolo. And it's about Bruce Lee. And it's about his family life in Hong Kong before, during, and immediately after World War II. And then it follows his life in the United States. 
there are, again, some fictionalized elements in this book. It talks about that in the back matter, simply because there are some conflicting accounts about his early life. No one realized exactly how famous Bruce Lee was going to be when he was young, so records and things have gotten lost and have gotten muddled through the years, but the author's re author really did do the best job he can, or he could, to piece together a narrative that seemed to make sense. Um, the art is very cinematic, and it, it suits the subject matter outstandingly well. Um, images from Chinese zodiac show up quite a bit. Um, it's really well done. It was, it was a good read. It was a, a quick read. It was a good read. That was very nice. My last option here is by two powerhouses in the kid lit world. It's by James Patterson and Kwame Alexander, and it's called Becoming Muhammad Ali. And um, it's before he was Muhammad Ali, he was Cassius Clay. And the parts that were from Ali or Clay's point of view are written in verse by Alexander who wrote the crossover, he wrote Oh, he's written any number of books, but he's known for his novels in verse. So again, it's a very quick read. Um, novels in verse frequently are, but it packs a punch. There are some illustrations in here as well, um, which are also very good. Um, so Alexander wrote those parts, and then there are some bits and prose that were written by James Patterson from the point of view of a character named Lucky or Lucius. And he is a fictionalized character who is a friend of Cassius Clay's. Um, and they provide more background information into what their family life was like, what their um, home life was like, what their, in their um, neighborhood was like. Um, Clay had a lot of friends growing up and he's sort of like a friend figure who is sort of like a stand-in friend figure. Um, it mostly focuses on Ali's early life and the training he went through in his teens. It is a quick, compelling read, and I think a lot of kids will probably really like it, and it just came out this year. So there we go. Those are some really great books, some really great reads, and I hope On This Table Somewhere is a book that will appeal to someone in your life. Have a great day, and I'll see you next time. Bye!